London news agents. It is crass and insensitive to be waging a public campaign in this way because we can just debate it, you and I, listeners can debate it, we can read the newspapers. We're not the Criminal Case Review Board. We have an independent judiciary in, the, in this country. I think we have a fair and successful independent judiciary in this country. Let the judicial process run its course. There is no purpose to a media campaign. It is for the courts to decide on the basis of evidence. And I would just remind people that, you know, we always presume innocence until people have been found guilty. Lucy Letby has been found guilty on multiple counts of serious crimes with multiple whole life sentences. And until the courts find reason to suggest otherwise, we should continue to regard her as a convicted killer serving multiple life sentences, delivering justice for those families going through in unimaginable and intolerable grief. That was the health secretary, Wes Streeting, talking to me on LBC about Lucy Letby and specifically about the mushrooming cloud of people, including top politicians who are questioning the verdict that was reached after a 10 month trial when she was found guilty for murdering seven babies and attempting to kill seven others. Something that some of the families of those victims have said is grotesque. And today, A public inquiry is beginning into how she murdered those seven newborns, into how those killings went unnoticed for months. It is not a trial. It is not an inquiry about her innocence or her guilt. It is about the wider culture of the NHS. But it gives us the opportunity to ask why this trial has attracted so many eyeballs, so many doubters, so many people raising questions about whether they can believe it. Welcome to the News Agents. It's Lewis. It's Emily. And a reminder that tomorrow morning, you may want to wake up with us at 1.30am to listen to the Harris-Trump debate live, the first time they'll have met. But if you don't, if you can resist that sweet invitation, we will be in your feeds as you commute or get up or wake up or run or work your dog tomorrow, walk your dog tomorrow with how that debate went. We agreed we'd stop offering to wake up with the listeners. (laughs) Speak for yourself. (laughs) That is on News Agents USA. But first, this question or this case around Lucy Letby has, I mean, it's an unprecedented case in many ways. And actually, the reaction to it, it seems to us, in terms of the online commentary, the kind of online sleuthing, the conspiracies which have resulted from it also feels unprecedented, at least in terms of the absolutely short length of time between conviction and where we are now, which is, as we were saying at the top, it reaching the very top of national political conversation, you know, Conservative MPs like David Davis, questioning whether the verdict was right. And the sheer kind of ubiquity of conspiracy is both really interesting, potentially disturbing, and it seemed to us worthy of discussion and analysis. I mean, let's just listen to just a collection of different conspiracies or commentaries, to put it a bit more charitably, that we found just on TikTok this afternoon about this case. What baffles me more than anything is that Lucy Letby's guilty verdict was on the basis of circumstantial evidence. There is no smoking gun, so to speak. The evidence against Ms. Letby is unsatisfactory for a conviction. It's so speculative. But I think we're doing this because she's a woman. The chart was really crucial in flavouring the further evidence. And I'm not convinced there's been no actual evidence, hardcore evidence, to prove that it was Lucy Letby that did it. We know she couldn't have done anything that she's accused of. Sounds horrible. She didn't do it. And I am very confident when I say that because I've done a lot of research. Lucy Letby is innocent. It's also statistically improbable that all the deaths that happened on Lucy's watch were murders. How on earth can this this young woman have done the things that she's been accused of? It, it, it can't be right. The Crown Prosecution Service have admitted that they got some of the evidence wrong. Some of the evidence used in the trial was faulty. A growing number of experts have raised concerns about her case over the last few weeks. Not true. They've made that up. The fact that there was no medical expert in the field that would stand up to defend Lisa Latby shows 
the bias in the medical industry anyway, doesn't it? So there you have a sample of what is out there. And I think I should say today, we are not about to relitigate the trial of Lucy Letby. We concede that we weren't in the court. It was a 10 month long trial. There was a jury that were an absolute certainty of, of her guilt over those seven killings and more attempted killings. So today the question we're asking is a slightly different one, a wider one, which is what is it about this trial that has attracted so much armchair sleuthing? And what does it say about us right now as a nation and our trust in our institutions and our laws and our courts that is allowing this kind of conspiracy or questioning charitably to flourish? Well, we're joined now by uh, David Aronovich, who has written a lot in the past about the rise of conspiracy within in our politics. He wrote a book called Voodoo Histories, all about that and why they take hold. David, do you think that this is a case with regards to, to Lucy Letby? Well, I suppose, do you think that it is um, what we're seeing are kind of traditional conspiracy theories? And why do you think that this case does seem to have captivated the imagination of so many people. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is, uh, I suppose, is that what you have is a, a set of inexplicable acts or alleged, well, proved in the court of law, but alleged, if you don't believe uh, uh, that Lucy Letby is guilty, which are very difficult to understand, really hard to comprehend. The second thing is that we do have a small history of people who uh, have had convictions overturn overturned for killing small children in ways that were not obvious in other words not by slitting their throats etc but by doing various things that didn't leave a mark upon them and Sally Clark's is the most obvious that has to be said there are also cases of people who uh, appealed and proved after and then confessed subsequently that they had killed their children but those ones are not cited so what you have here and we also have this incredible true crime genre uh, uh, which runs through everything now, which is um, kind of only murders in the building type stuff, which is everybody thinks that they're cap capable of solving uh, murders. And the original, if you remember, the original of this was Serial, which was all about somebody trying to prove that somebody else had been falsely accused of murder and falsely convicted of murder. So these things put together kind of create a sort of... A, a, perfect storm the, the the height of perfection of which is just the sheer level of publicity yeah. that this case got david just before we we move on too quickly i think we should explain the sally clark um trial which was a mistrial it was a woman who's tragically who's two two baby infants both died and the statistician who was brought in at the time roy meadows suggested i think it was a one in 78 million chance or something that led to her conviction which was then proved absolutely false and he was an expert witness who had as it turned out no expertise it is your worry that we are litigating the last mistrial maybe this time round that people feel yeah. that they're now informed about something that went wrong and so it's upon us upon them to make sure it doesn't happen again this is always a worry the roy meadows uh, evidence the statistical evidence was one part of the evidence but i think the main case for um overturning the conviction was actually um uh, was actually the discovery that one of the children had actually had an infection this and that this information was kept from uh, the defence. Mm. Um, uh, but the other difference between, so that is the case of Sally Clark. Sally Clark's uh, case was uh, um, overturned uh, and she went through hell and subsequently um, most people who knew her said that her subsequent death from uh, alcoholism was actually due to the fact that she'd been convicted. So it was a kind of treble tragedy. Yeah. Um, and of course, there are other famous cases of wrongful conviction, which we can think of going back down in, uh, in history, and there, are, and there are enough of them. But the th thing that's funny about this one is that the leading, the, the leading, if you like, kind of scientific force saying that this particular, the Lucy Letby conviction might be unsafe, seems to be or at least should be reviewed in a significant way comes from the people connected with the royal St uh, statistical society but the problem in this case is as we we're saying statistics is not the basis on which the uh, on which the trial turned um so one of the things that they've said for example is well yes you do get cluster cases so it's not so wouldn't shouldn't be regarded so very unusual that two babies died most in an average year but across these two years it was up to seven or eight well, that's true, 
That is absolutely true. But the the uh, clinicians who are looking at the sudden uh, uh, bolts of cases in their in their hospital surely couldn't be criticised for saying, "Hold on, we'd better look to see if something odd is going on here." Yeah. After all, that was the basis that eventually caught Harold Shipman. So this is a strangely led case. The trial took ten months. Um, all kinds of bits of evidence, circumstantial evidence, including things that Lucy Letby herself uh, had written, were adduced. So what it was was essentially a kind of jigsaw case, uh, of which statistics actually, funny enough, were not a bit. And yet the objection is mostly uh, about the statistical case. And I was listening to David Davies, um, who I think, although he's a very clever politician, I, is a, I would describe as intellectually erratic uh, in many ways uh, in his career. And I think other people kind of thought so, really kind of championing the case of Lucy Letby. And I got the strong impression that he didn't quite understand what the case had turned on. I mean, one of the questions, I guess, is about absence of, isn't it? Because the, the, the sort of famously, there was no one smoking gun in this case. It wasn't like, you know, the bloodied knife or the, you know, the candlestick, as it were. So when there is an absence of one thing, is that where it grows? Is that the 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 sort of room, you know, or the sort of the petri dish into which all the other questions gather? Do you think? I think that's partially it. It's also a kind of suspicion of the fact that uh, uh, a suspicion of the fact that we now know more about confirmation bias, and there's always the suspicion that the prosecution and the police and the clinicians were engaging in a form of confirmation bias, looking for a culprit when perhaps there was no culprit because they wanted to find one, finding the person who most obviously fit, and then essentially looking at all the evidence in order to kind of suggest that this was one. So I think there is a kind of suspicion of that way of thinking. Then, as I said, there's this kind of deep desire to be the person who uncovers the real truth about this miscarriage of justice and so on. That's a very, that's a kind of very big element, it seems to me, psychologically uh, uh, in all this. And you kind of put them together with what you've said, which is you haven't got a video of somebody taking a pillow and going and smothering a baby. Um, uh, what you have is all kinds of little bits of different sorts of things which added up to convince the jury that there was actually guilt there, which wasn't overturned on, on appeal. Now, none of the three of us had the expertise to know for sure what actually happened. All you can say in the end is that we didn't sit through the 10-month trial and we didn't hear all the evidence and weren't asked to weigh it all up together. Um, so on that basis, I would make a kind of prior judgment that I would be inclined to trust that process more at the moment than I would trust the people who've been critical of it. But that doesn't mean that any either any of the three of us know. Is there an element, David, of, of two other factors at play here as well, which is that on the one hand, in recent years, we have had more and more exposure of the frailties of, of the British state, right? And the way that the British state works, maybe not just in terms of miscarriages of, of, of justice, but in all sorts of different ways. When one thinks of the post office inquiry, Grenfell, all sorts the of blood different scandal. things. Blood scandal. People have become perhaps more, have a proclivity to be more suspicious of the way the state operates. And then you add into that as well, something you've already referred to, which is an incomprehension about motive of this particular person, of Letby herself, particularly because, frankly, of the sort of person that she is, that she is a young woman, attractive woman, and we look at her and we think, why on earth would she want to kill babies? Something else must be up here, and it probably has to do with a thing about which we become more suspicious, which is the state. Yeah, I mean, uh, I th I th there are two kind of elements to that. I mean, the first thing is that uh, that kind of perception of whether or somebody, in your opinion, would be a person who would be likely to be guilty of something is part of what shielded Harold Shipman for such a long time. Mm. Um, lovely old avuncular family doctor who everybody knew and everybody trusted would come round, etc. Very much the kind of picture of Harold Shipman. Uh, and I still don't think that we can say that we comprehend entirely why he decided to end the lives of so many elderly and some not quite so elderly, frankly, people quite so prematurely. But then come to your first point, which is the point about distrust of um, the state. It's ironic in a way because most of what we're talking about when we talk about these other scandals, but this less so, are, tend to be historic. 
In other words, they tend to have happened in uh, in the past. The by far and away the worst case of um, of miscarriage of justice, of course, was the Birmingham Six. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a case in the seventies, which became an absolute kind of cause celebre. So, whether or not this kind of responds to an actual set of new things that we didn't have before, I doubt. But what you could argue is that we simply have lost the habit of deference. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'd throw Hillsborough into that as well. I mean, actually, yeah. you know, which was n- numbers unconscionable that were all sort of tarnished. At, Terrible. Yeah. And, and, and and the cover-up that took decades. I guess the question is, on the one hand, you say we are all armed with this new democratic ability to ask questions, to ask questions of those in power, to ask questions about, you know, who might be covering up what. But it's only a little leap before you get into where America seems to be sitting, which Ah. is, you know, those around Trump saying there were irregularities, there were cover-ups, the voting machines were were fixed, let's all, you know, descend on the Capitol. I mean, we're obviously, we're not there yet, but, but is your sense that when people are asking questions, that is a good way to air all the things that people are thinking, you know, it's, it's worth knowing what the conspiracies are, or are we actually energising conspiracies? I mean, I think this is a really central question. You could argue that um, uh, given Elon Musk, etc., what happens in America doesn't stay in America. It's absolutely happening right uh, uh, right on our doorstep. Um, uh, what happened over the identification of... Um, uh, of the young man who murdered those three children in Southport being an absolute case in point. Yeah. Um, and that was instant. And a large amount of it was um, uh, was amplified from abroad. So I think this is I think this is a, a very good question. The answer, I suppose, is it depends how robust your systems are for dealing with with it how good your legal system is how good your uh inte- other parts of your system are in investigating properly what's important it seems to me whether it's a university or government or a court of law is that you maintain a very clear sense of your own role uh, in discovering and saying what's true and also in discovering in saying clearly what it is you do and don't know mm-hmm. um in that sense, it's, uh, I think it's critical. If, if you do that, I think you can deal with the fact that there will always be people who want to say, nah, you know, uh, and in, in the famous words of Audrey Hepburn in My Fair Lady, no, nah, I, I say as they done her in. But it is an interesting, um, but it is an interesting question, isn't it, David? Because that, you've referred to them to one already, the Birmingham Six is the girl for four, that there have been examples of historic miscarriages of justice which have partly been reappraised Andrew Malkinson more recently partly become reappraised and put right because of media pressure and so it's yeah. an in, there is an interesting dilemma right for, for journalists in terms of how to cover this I mean this is obviously very new it's only just started this, this, this process but in terms of how to both respect the institution respect the institutional judgment without sort of leaning into conspiracy or whatever but also recognise that these miscarriages of justice, not saying it's happened here, but they do happen. I think that's absolutely true. And you can find cases of really good investigative journalists who have both taken up cases which have been found to be miscarriages of justice and also championed cases which absolutely turned out not to be miscarriages yeah. of mm-hmm. justice. And by the way, quite often didn't admit that they'd been found not to be miscarriages of justice along the way, because that's sometimes the nature of our trade. I think the thing that you're pointing at, however, is that there used to be, as there was at the time of Birmingham Six, a kind of an automatic deference to what somebody with a big wig would say and what the establishment would say and what would be a kind of establishment uh, uh, position. Um, And there is no such automatic deference now. So you can't actually rely upon any, on so much of an impulse in the public saying, yeah, well, they probably got it right, etc. So if I say to you... um, jury heard it for 10 months we've not heard it so my inclination would be on the face of it knowing that nothing until i know something more about it to go with the jury people are less inclined to make to say that mm. thing possibly than they were 30 years ago 40 years ago i would guess is any bit of your mind leaving the door open here david yeah, totally. Uh, firstly, because I haven't studied in depth myself, so I certainly couldn't come to any kind of conclusions. Anything I would do, any, anything like that. I mean, you know, it's a 10-month trial. If you want to kind of dig into the transcripts, so the one thing I do know 
is that statistical evidence didn't play a big part yeah. in it. And given that, the statistician's uh, objection seems to me to be kind of almost, almost, in the first bit, almost pedantic. David, thank you for just talking us through that. It's been absolutely fascinating. I do think that question about how we cover it is, is a, a really sort of crucial one, a cardinal one, in the sense that it is a fine line for us to walk. We've been trying to do it in this episode kind of all throughout, which is that... I mean, we should say we were quite nervous about this, yes. right? Sort of walking into a conspiracy or oxygenating a conspiracy, but also allowing for this idea that there are, of course, mistrials, right? Yeah. There are miscarriages. And that's possible. Yeah. Uh, and, and we've got to be open to that. I think mm. the problem, of course, comes in terms of, as, as we were saying at the top, for me anyway, it's the kind of alacrity, the kind of speed of it and the instant assumption from people as david was saying there that um it's kind of an almost an inversion of where we used to be as a society we used to have so much deference that yeah, we probably we almost everything. never question anything and now it's like we believe nothing and so, that is the default yeah, which i, mean, I the, find caustic and okay, worrying the question the question i have for you or for us is you can easily point to all these terrible miscarriages, and we've named them throughout the episode, whether it's the blood scandal, whether it's the infected blood, whether it was Hillsborough, whether it was the post office one most recently, and so on, and say, oh, aren't people getting wiser about this stuff now? And isn't it good that we're doing this? Or else you could just say, sod it, you know what? It's just about the internet. It's just about more people sitting at home in their rooms going through incredible you know, chambers and depths and arguments with people they've never met before. Mm. And actually, it doesn't even matter whether you've had miscarriages in the past. People will be doing it anyway. And I also think it is about the fact that she's a woman. I think it is, and a young woman, killing babies. I think it is just difficult for us. I think we... We, we there can't comprehend. There aren't that many female serial killers, right? Like, mm. when we think of serial killers, mm. we think of... Myra Hindley. Well, I mean, that is one. But again, that was... She also was a subject of enormous yeah. interest, right? Yes. Because of it. But, you know... There are so many, when we think of serial killers, we tend to think of men, we tend to think of young men, spree killers, all of these these kinds of things. You know, when we saw, for example, Wayne Cousins, who killed Sarah Everard, yeah. no one is sat there thinking, why did he do that? Or maybe we well, are. Nobody's sat there thinking, oh, it couldn't possibly yeah, have been exactly. him. No one is sat there thinking, going to come up with that, oh, that couldn't possibly be have him, happened. and then come yeah. up, couldn't, you know, no way. We just think, oh, we, we see the A to B in our minds yeah, as to yeah, why yeah. that's happened. Whereas with Let Be... We just can't see it. We can't comprehend it, partly because she's a woman, partly because she's a young one, partly because she's killing babies. Yeah. None of it seems to compute in our mind. And so it seems to me to just be the most fertile territory imaginable and throw in what we've just been saying, the sort of internet culture as it is, a distrust of institutions. It seems to me to have all come together in this one case. Mm -hmm. And before you know where we are, only how many months afterwards, we're all at a national political level talking about it and whether it must, might be unsound. Yeah. And everyone has got an opinion about yeah. things they just don't know. And sometimes it's enough to say, I just don't know, as opposed to, why don't we know? Or it's not one for me. Yeah. Well, the other trial that has, um, this sounds crazy in a way, but it has sort of captured the imagination of the British public and presumably, I'm guessing, the French public because it is almost unfathomable, the level of depravity that is being discussed here. And we're joined by Peter Conradi, who is the Europe editor of the Sunday Times, who was reporting from the court in Avignon uh, last week about this case of a husband allegedly repeatedly drugging his wife with tranquilizers to allow, invite many other men to rape her over the course of a decade or more. Just, I, I mean, I don't really know where to start, Peter. It's like a horror film. It's like the plot of a horror film. I mean, you can't really imagine this happening. And I mean, you say inviting men in. I mean, he appears to invi have invited in more than 80 men over the course of 10 years who came round to the family home waited until he kind of gave them the all clear and said, my wife is sufficiently sedated now. And they came in and they raped her. Um, in some cases, some of these men visited as often as five or six times. Other men uh, came there only once, only once, stayed several hours. And in the course of all this, they, these men, we should say, were recruited on a website, he, Dominique Pellico, the main accused, filmed them all, um, and at times he joined in, and he asked on occasions them to have sex with him. So, I mean, it, it doesn't get 
any darker yeah. or any more appalling. Just remind us how this came to light, because, uh, I mean, it's I call it the sort of the Al Capone arrest in a way. It was that sort of thing where it came out of the blue to the woman involved, to the actual victim. It did indeed. I mean, this is what makes it all even more extraordinary. And I'm sorry to keep using that word because she apparently all this period was completely unaware as she, as she described in court in her, her testimony last Thursday, which was really absolutely incredible and, and, and very, very brave indeed. She would go to bed every evening in her pajamas. Um, she would wake up the next morning in her pajamas in exactly the same place and would not have any knowledge of what had happened in the intervening eight or nine hours, 10 hours in which she, she, she had been asleep. And how did she find out about this? Well, this all began, I mean, his whole world, as it were, began to, to fall apart and or, you know, authorities closed in on him. Back in 2020, in September 2020, he was in a supermarket in Carpentras, a, a little town not very far from the village in which they lived. And he was upskirting women who were shopping in the supermarket. He was just trying to take photographs of them up their skirts. He, you know, obviously 70, he was then 67. So 67 year old man trying to take photographs of women in the supermarket. Obviously the police were called. He was arrested. Um, had it not been for the sort of the, the perseverance of the police, he would probably have just got off with a warning or with a minor, you know, a minor punishment or so on. You know, relatively, you know, creepy, but relatively minor crime. However, thankfully, they looked into his phone, they looked into, they went to his home and they looked into his computer. And they then began to discover the images and the video that he'd taken of all these men raping his wife. And they then called, the police then called his wife Giselle in to see them. And they, you know, they essentially said to her, we've got something very, very shocking to tell you about your husband. And they proceeded to show her the photographs. And at first she didn't, she didn't recognize who this woman was lying in a bed. And she suddenly realized, you know, hey, it's me. And then later, and it took her a year or so before she was ready to do this, they then showed her video footage of that her husband had taken of these men raping her. And you know, it was clear then to her, no doubt whatsoever, what had happened. Peter, the victim in all of this um, has taken the unusual but pretty courageous step of not having this trial in, in private. It has been public. You've attended it um, in Avignon. What was your impression of, of her? And just give us your sense of what that trial has been like from the inside. Well, I was there for a few days last week. I mean, it started on, on Monday of last week. Um, the most interesting day, the most traumatic day was Thursday, which was when she actually took to the stand and made a statement for about 30, 40 minutes, speaking very, very fluently, very calmly, never once breaking down, never once sort of raising her voice, in anger, it was it was an, an extraordinary performance, I think. And she was then questioned for another perhaps couple of hours or so by defence lawyers, because on trial here are not just Dominique Pellico, her husband, but also fifty of the of the eighty other men who they managed to they managed to apprehend. And so you know each of them have got lawyers, so she faced an awful lot of very very intrusive questioning from those lawyers. You know, asking her details of her sex life, what form of contraception she used, uh, you know, all manner of very, very invasive questions. Their aim was clearly to prove that she was somehow complicit in this. But, you know, they're having an awfully difficult time proving her complicity because she was very, very heavily sedated the whole time with, with, with very strong sleeping tablets, very large numbers of which the police then found uh, when they searched when they searched the couple's house. You know, her husband had hidden them away in all manner of places. And Peter, one of the reasons um, that this looks like it could make sort of legal history in France 
I mean, apart from the fact that she's taken this extraordinary, courageous decision to be public, is around that question of consent, isn't it? And whether rape is considered rape without consent or whether you actually have to withhold consent and say no for it to be considered rape. I mean, that's a different law in France to the UK, isn't it? There is and there has been a very long debate going on in France about what the definition of rape is. And it's it's a debate that's been going on for for several years, um, during the course of which <clears throat> the law has been tightened and tightened. But one thing that isn't crucial to it is whether there's been consent or there hasn't been consent. And, you know, a number of campaigners say, I think quite understandably, that this is, this is a failing of the law. There were attempts at a European level to introduce a kind of an EU-wide um, Definition. requirement for consent. This France refused to join for various sort of arcane legal reasons. Uh, Macron himself has said that consent should be, you know, you should explicitly have to give consent before having sex. Um, that has yet to find itself into legislation in part because we haven't had a, a government here until uh, a couple of days ago yeah. for about several months. So, you know, this it, it is there is a very broad issue there. I mean, I think in this case, you know, it's not, he's not going to get off because no one can prove that um, she didn't consent to it. I mean, I wonder quite, you know, this was someone who was heavily sedated. It's very, very clear that she didn't agree to it. And there are various other provisions in the law, I think, which will mean that, uh, you know, he can certainly, he, without jumping the gun, obviously, that he can certainly be convicted of it. But Peter, you said in your piece in the Sunday Times this week, I mean, you said... The shocking events that have been recounted in Avignon courtroom are emblematic of a deep misogyny. So why hasn't it provoked more of a response? Because we're talking about how shocking it is, how extraordinary it is. And yet you seem to be implying that perhaps it is being not treated with the gravity within France that perhaps we might expect. What do you mean by that? I think what, what is what is interesting is the way that it has been has been covered by the media. And I mean, one could imagine that um, had something like this, you know, had the same series of events been taking place in Britain, that it would have been on the front page of every newspaper running, you know, running for, for a week at least in the run up to the trial and certainly during the first days of the trial. But what I think is surprising is, yes, it is being reported by the French media. But if you look at, say, the two main national newspapers, Le Monde, which is a sort of Guardian kind of equivalent or Figaro, which is like Times Daily Telegraph kind of equivalent, Neither of them have put the story on the front page. It's sort of, it's kind of tucked away on the inside pages, on the sort of the crime pages. There's almost this feeling, you know, this is a bit sort of grubby, a bit unpleasant to put on the front page of your newspaper. I mean, to some extent, this is because of the enormity of what Dominique Pellico was accused of having done. I mean, it's not as if in the country there are a large number of men who are going to invite 80 other men they've met on the internet over to rape their wife. You know, but there, is, there seems to be a kind of a reluctance to talk more broadly about the the general issue. And I think for me, the most interesting thing, which again, the media here are not really talking about, is not really why Dominique Pellico would do it, but how easy it appears to have been yeah. to find 80 other men who were prepared to sort of to drive to this village in France and to accept someone's invitation to rape their sleeping wife. This um, case, the more you read about it, the kind of harder it is to, to get your head around it. I mean, the every single detail that has been reported seems more horrific than the last. I mean, the women involved ended up with four sexually transmitted diseases as a result of this. One of the men that her husband invited to come around was HIV positive. They were never told, never asked to wear condoms. Never asked to wear condoms. And... The moment sort of recounted in a trial about, you know, her being told that this had happened, having to have a file passed over to her with some of the pictures when she thinks she's just gone into the police station to discuss her husband's upskirting and then having to discuss it with her children and inform her children that not only was their father going to prison for rape or highly likely to be doing so, but that that rape involved her and involved 80 up to 80 other men. It is difficult to even begin to comprehend it. 
And I think in political terms, it's really interesting to see who has come forward and who hasn't. I mean, we heard from Peter that Macron has actually sort of stepped into this debate and said, you have to give consent before sex. Only one politician uh, from the Assembly has actually come out so far and called this out as horrendous. And, and that woman is Sandine Josso, who has in the past accused a colleague of spiking her to assault her. So I guess this feels very raw. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of comparing that, and maybe that's a dangerous thing to do, with what I imagine would be the response here in the UK, if God forbid the same case. I mean, there is no way you wouldn't have a legion of female MPs, and I would hope male MPs too, well, there'd Same. be an urgent question in the House of Commons for sure. Straight away, yeah. right? But it does suggest that somehow perhaps there is a more hands-off approach, you know, to, to sort of political interventions of, of, of what happens in the home. Or maybe they're just waiting for the end of the trial and maybe we'll see, you know, the sort of the full effect it's having then. But it does seem strangely removed from... I guess, you know, sort of wider public life political debate this in France. Yeah, I think it's um, it's really interesting what Peter was saying there. I think I think some of it is about the media culture and the sort of political culture generally. I think that within France there might be a feeling within, within the press and indeed w- within the parliament as well that this is a sort of local affair. It's not a kind of national political affair. And that is kind of, we have a much more kind of centralised political media culture mm. in, in this country. Mm. What tends to be the story in one place, for good or ill, is kind of the national media Everyone. story. It yeah. runs on broadcast and it runs on on, on in print as well, as more of a sort of heard. Um, and so I think that there's a bit of that. But I, I do think, as, as Peter was alluding to, it does perhaps allude to at least maybe the different kind of place or the different place the different national conversations are at with regards to this it's it's hard not to conclude that there would be and maybe it would go too far in britain that lessons would be overlearned but i think that there would be a a bit of real national soul searching about it if it were taking place Mm. in britain and again maybe maybe as peter was alluding to maybe that would be a mistake because it's not as if lots of people in you 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 ban date rate drugs already Right? Yeah. It's not like people are sort of offering you rehypnol on yeah. at, at the news agents kind of thing, right? No. So, it, I mean, I guess in legal terms, what what actually could change? What what is the what is the change? Well, I suppose in a way, I mean, it sounds as if something I wasn't aware of, but it, it sounds as if, um, in terms of what it means for French rape law, the fact mm. that there could be a, any ambiguity at all about whether these men had committed mm. rape as we would understand it seems mind-boggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so. Um, and I'm not sure if that would apply in the in the British case or not. I suspect. And I not. guess, funnily enough, the upskirting thing, right? For for all those people, it, it, it's a kind of reminder, which is a really complicated one, which is that small crimes can often be your absolute window into massive crimes. You know, it's the what what they used to call the broken window strategy in New York in the 90s. You know, go and investigate a broken window or a dodgy registration number, which is how they caught the Yorkshire Ripper, literally, you know, outside my sister's school, right, in the mm. in the sort of 1980s. Go and investigate the guy who's been upskirting because there's a very big chance that he's done much worse. Maybe there's another element of this as well, which obviously we've sort of brought it back to the first part of the show, which is that it's certainly true to say that in terms of national media interest and personal interest in true crime mm. which obviously the Letby case was almost a kind of ground zero for or yeah, has yeah. been that sort of interest particularly in podcasting and other things has, has exploded and um, I'm not sure whether that's quite the same in, in, in France as it, as it is elsewhere when I lived there it certainly wasn't but this was so many years ago and I think that certainly you can imagine if this were happening in Britain or in the United States very, very quickly, and maybe they will anyway, but you can imagine that very, very quickly Netflix or a podcast series or whatever will be made in almost no short order about this. And maybe that will happen anyway. But it is also reflective of that turn that certainly in this sort of Anglo-American kind of sphere, culturally, we have become obsessed with cases like this. That is not to say that you shouldn't learn the lessons where, where, where they are and where they exist, but it certainly is It is sort of part of the cultural turn in all of these things. That these things happen, and in very, very quickly, the kind of sp- length of time where you would jump very quickly to kind of the analysis, the retelling of the story, that seemed feel has shrunk. truncated and shrunk a lot in recent years. Before we go, um, an update on a story that we've been following throughout the year on the news agents. This is um, relation to Paul Marshall, you might remember he is in- becoming an increasingly big figure on the British media stage. He's a very, very wealthy hedge fund owner. 
And he has sealed a £100 million takeover of The Spectator magazine. He also is one of the primary uh, backers, financial backers, of GB News. So he had also been hoping, as we were reporting earlier in the year, to buy The Telegraph. That is still uh, ongoing. But it does show that he's becoming an increasingly, with The Spectator and GB News, in his stable of media products now, shows he's becoming a very big figure on the right of politics and in conservative politics more generally. And as Paul Marshall steps in, Andrew Neil uh, steps out, down, uh, former Sun Times editor and chairman of The Spectator, um, has confirmed, he said it, I made it clear many months ago, I'd stepped down when a new owner took over. And he's also said it's his greatest regret not to have found a new home guaranteed to nurture the unique chemistry of the magazine, which suggests, I mean, more than suggests, that he was not particularly in favour of Marshall taking over. We know that Andrew Neil wanted to stop um, the UAE deal going through the Redbird one, which would have seen, um, you know, an Arab nation essentially in control of it. But he says we didn't have the power to choose our new owner or even influence who it was to be. So I, I guess this is something that is going to split, you know, not just the journalists at the magazine or former owners of the magazine, but also readers as well because of the kind of stories. I mean, you, Lewis, brought mm. us um, a few months ago the story of, of where Paul Marshall sits in the firmament of right-wing politics. Yeah, I mean, um, Andrew Neil had said previously that he didn't think any hedge fund owner um, should uh, be able to buy a newspaper, which he considers the spectator to be. Uh, yeah, I mean, Marshall, the concerns about Marshall from the sort of moderate wing of the Conservative Party have been that he has been accused of not being a Conservative, but being a very radical sort of voice on the right of British politics. Um, obviously, he's he's a big backer, as I say, of, of GB News. GB News, as we know, has gone down a very particular type of direction, quite a sort of populist a la Trumpian sort of direction. Uh, Ofcom has carried out 23 formal investigations to it amid 13 uh, breaches of broadcast rules by GB News related to lack of impartiality so far. We revealed on the news agents earlier in the year that Paul Marshall, from his uh, private Twitter account, had been retweeting and liking extremist far-right material, including lots of conspiracy theories. And so there is a concern, which Marshall and his allies deny, there is a concern that he is trying to kind of change the kind of firmament of kind of traditional right-wing or centre-right kind of publications in this country, including The Telegraph, and pushing it in a more radical direction, and thereby exerting a very profound influence on the Conservative Party, because, of course, we know that GB News is having a bigger and bigger influence on the, on the Conservative Party and the Reform Party, right of centre politics, but also now The Spectator and potentially even The Telegraph Well, that's as well. an interesting point. Th this doesn't necessarily mean that he can buy The Telegraph. No, Because they were separated off. But we don't know yet who it. is going to buy The Telegraph, yeah. and we know that his name's in the running. In other unrelated but important media news... John Sopel, we hear, is on his way home. Sopel Force One is in the air Touching as down we speak. On his own. Literally airstrip. less than a dozen people are currently tracking it on Flight Tracker as and we speak. Lucky boy, he gets to wake up at 1.30 tomorrow morning to listen to the Trump Harris debate, the first meeting the two of them will have. And we will bring you that episode recorded bleary eyed at roughly four AM in your feeds for your Wednesday morning commute. So we'll see you then. They could do it a bit earlier, couldn't they? It's very annoying how late it is for us. They do it on purpose. It it's annoying. George the Third and all that. Uh, yeah, yes. They need to let that go. I know. Move on. Move yeah. on. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 